Hey folks, Matt Easton here. Now, um, David Reddy, who's a viewer of the channel, um, put a really good question up under a recent video of mine. So thank you to David Reddy for this question. Um, hopefully a fairly straightforward and simple answer. It is about um, antique swords, and not just British, but uh, European military swords in general in the, uh, let's say, 19th century, but also into the 20th century, and also to some extent in the 18th century as well. Um, and um, he specifically asked, he said, can you explain the what the regulations were around sort of regulation models of sword? Because on this channel, he sees a lot of things which are non-regulation. Well, firstly, I'll say thanks for asking the question. Anybody else out there who's got questions which you think I might be able to answer, of course, feel free to post them underneath my latest video. I do check all the comments, so I will usually see, uh, I don't see all the comments, but I see most of the comments. Um, and in terms of this um, specific question, so I have to explain that I specifically collect and am preparing a book talking about non-regulation swords. That it is uh, an officer's sword specifically. That is, uh, therefore, swords which don't comply to normal regulations. So if you watch this channel, you may be under the impression that there are a lot of non-regulation swords. There aren't. Okay, so regulation means exactly what it sounds like. It means that if you were um, an officer in a European military in the 19th century or indeed into the 20th century, and indeed into the later 18th century, um, you would by regulation, depending upon your branch of service, and I'll explain that in a second, be expected to wear a specific type of sword. Now, before I go into that, I have to also explain that there is a fundamental difference between officers' swords and issued or troopers' swords, okay? So let's take the cavalry, for example. So within the cavalry, you have essentially three types of um, men, uh, serving in the cavalry at any one time. You have private soldiers. Now, privates in the cavalry were known as troopers rather than privates. Privates are infantry. Uh, if you're in the artillery, then you're known as a gunner. So in the infantry, privates. In the artillery, gunners. In the navy, sailors. Um, and in the cavalry, um, troopers. And they didn't buy their own swords. There may be some rare exceptions to that, but generally speaking, they didn't buy their own swords. They weren't allowed to use their own swords. They were issued or given a sword. Now, they wouldn't get to keep that sword all the time. They wouldn't get to keep it for their whole career. That sword belonged to the regiment. Okay, So the regiment was um, issued swords by the government. And this is true of any European military that I've ever looked at. Um, they were issued weapons. Uh, by, by the government, the regiment were issued weapons, and those weapons were of the model of the time. So say, for example, you were in the British cavalry just about to go off to the Crimean War um, in 1854, the chances are that you're, uh, if you're a trooper, cavalry trooper, you are, pro you know, Trooper Hughes or whatever, tr Trooper Jones, your weapon that you're, you have, the sword that you have, is issued to you from the regimental armoury, um, and that is probably an 1853 pattern um, cavalry trooper's sword. It could potentially be the previous model, the 1821 pattern cavalry trooper's sword, um, because the regiments didn't all get issued the new weapons at the same time. So it, 1854 is one of those examples where in, in 1854 some regiments had the new 1853 pattern, some regiments didn't. But going back to the three basic types of soldier, you've got private soldiers, essentially, who are your, your enlisted, your recruits, your, your men, who make up the majority of, you know, what, 90, 95% of, of any fighting force. Then you have the non-commissioned officers, and those are people who have been privates or troopers or sailors and have risen up to become things like corporals, um, sergeants, sergeant majors. Okay, So those are essentially people who've been uh, enlisted into the military and have through length of service, sometimes through qualifications as well, or just general aptitude. Some were risen up quite, uh, quite young just because they were good. Um, they have become a non-commissioned officer. Some people would argue that non-commissioned officers are some of the most important men in the military because they're the experienced soldiers on the ground and they're the vital connection, connecting point between 
the, the, the private soldiers who are the majority and the officers and the command. Okay? And then finally you have officers. Now in the 19th century in many militaries, not all, but in many militaries in Europe and America, um, officers essentially um, purchased their commissions. Now that wasn't always the case. In France, for example, they famously had a system whereby you could literally join the ranks as a private, you could advance through being a, a, you know, a corporal and a sergeant, and you could actually become an officer. This did occasionally happen in, um, in Britain. Um, if someone did something really extraordinary or was really an amazing individual, for example, if someone won the Victoria Cross and they were a sergeant, sometimes they would be given a commission free of charge. Um, but for most of the 19th century, in most European countries and North America, um, it was normal for an officer to be a person with a fair amount of money um, who would purchase their way into the military with the rank of um, usually sub-lieutenant or lieutenant, okay? Um, so, um, though their swords are very different to the, to the privates and the sergeants and the corporals, okay? So if you were a private, we've looked at them, or a trooper, you would be issued your weapons by the regimental armory, and that is true of the non-commissioned officers as well. In some cases, Non-commissioned officers were given better quality um, swords as a private item. Uh, so you sometimes see them with dedications on the blade saying this is being given to Sergeant whatever as a, you know, in gratitude of his service, blah, blah, blah. But usually they used regimentally owned swords. They didn't own their own swords, okay? So we have trooper swords, we have sergeant swords, which are very often the same as trooper swords, but very occasionally they have their own models particularly in the infantry, not really so much in the cavalry um, or the artillery. Um, and then officer swords like this are private purchase. So the officer owns his sword. It is not regimentally owned. So they are not issued their swords. They buy their swords. Now, let's look at non-regulation swords for a second. Where do non-regulation swords fit into this? Well, quite simply, the troopers or privates or sailors or gunners, um, so that the rankers, the men, okay, they were issued their swords and their swords were a fixed regulation design and at intervals these were updated. So in Britain, in the cavalry for example, we have the 1796 light and heavy versions, then the 1821 light and heavy versions, then the 1853 universal version, then the 1864 universal version, then 1882, 1885, 1890, 1899. 1908 and boom that's where we are now. Um, there are some exceptions with the household cavalry and various other uh, units who had their own distinctive models of sword but generally speaking those are all the British cavalry patterns that run from 1788 right the way through to 1908. Um, and if you were a cavalry trooper, you got issued your sword, you had no choice, that was your sword. The only thing that you could do personally, potentially, to make it somewhat better, if, if that's what you wanted to do, uh, was make sure it was really sharp. Um, and that is something that Alfred Hutton talks about in his um, 1867 book, The Cavalry Swordsman. He says, he says that cavalry troopers should all be given a file, a little hand file, um, and that they should maintain their own sword edges themselves and keep them nice and sharp. And he talks about the type of edge and that kind of stuff. But um, so, yep, you'd be issued your sword, you had no say in what quality it was or what design it was, that was just the model that you were issued. And if you were in the cavalry in, let's say, 1850, you'd start out your career with an 1822 pattern, either light or heavy, depending whether you're in the light cavalry or the heavy cavalry. The only real difference is in the guard design. Um, and then in 1853, when or 53, 54, when your regiment got a new model of sword, You'd have bye bye old sword that's gone that'd be taken away from you and you'd be issued a new sword. So if you're a private soldier, a ranker, or an NCO, that's your um, status quo. If you're an officer, similar situation in terms of uh, regulation models. Okay, so this, for example, the folding flap at the side, brass guard, um, Wilkinson style uh, blade with a fuller in it. This is the regulation. Um, 1845 pattern infantry officer's sword. So what would be the scenario if you were 
paying to join the army as an infantry officer, as a second lieutenant or a lieutenant. Um, if it was the cavalry, you'd be a cornet or ensign. Uh, sorry, ensign's infantry, um, but a cornet and cavalry. But if you were joining as a, an ensign or a lieutenant or second lieutenant in the infantry um, in, let's say, 1850, okay, then this is the model of sword that you would be expected to wear. So, if you're being advised that you must buy this regulation model of infantry officer's sword because you're just about to become an infantry officer, you're probably about 20 years old, um, you're going into the army for the first time, you get given a list of all the things you're expected to buy. It includes your uniform, your boots, um, perhaps a pistol, um, telescope, um, potentially a horse, um, uh, like all the stuff you would need, eating equipment, bedding equipment, changes of clothes, um, different types of uniform for different occasions, dress uniform for evenings, um, potentially different field service uniforms. You might have to buy, a, um, if you're going to a certain Indian regiment, for example, you might have a, a red um, field service uniform and a khaki field service uniform, uh, pith helmets, different types of hats, um, you know, patrol cap, as well as different, you know, a shako maybe. So a huge amount of stuff they had to purchase. And therefore, most officers purchased what was the standard regulation sword. And that was what you would be expected to wear on parade. Now, there's one important thing to say. If you were on campaign, say for example in Afghanistan in, uh, in the 1840s, for example, if you were on campaign in the 1840s in Afghanistan, then um, once you were actually out in the field, you could pretty much carry whatever weapons you liked, okay? Um, it would be more dependent upon your superior officers um, or the commanding officer of the regiment um, if they had any objection to anything you might carry, you might be blocked from carrying it. But fundamentally, that's why we see a whole bunch of uh, British officers carrying tulwars in photographs and artwork from the 1850s, 1840s, 50s and 60s. Um, became less fashionable later, but um, we see a lot of them carrying tulwars in the field because they're good swords. Okay, um, Potentially, perhaps, there's some degree of blending in with or showing camaraderie with if you've got Indian soldiers and you're a, Indi a British officer straight out from England, then you might be kind of like, you know, hey chaps, I'm one of you, I'll carry one of your style of swords because they're really cool and stuff like that. So there might be a degree of diplomacy involved as well and politics, but they are good swords, so why not carry one? So once you're in the field, you could carry basically whatever you wanted. That could involve, that could include an old ancestral sword or a sword that you've bought locally or captured during campaign. That was fairly common as well. Uh, in fact, I know examples from the Indian Mutiny of British officers and the Sikh Wars of British officers carrying Indian swords that they had captured in fighting against uh, the enemy. Um, but there is another category, and this is what I specialise in, is the non-regulation British officer's sword. Now that fulfils an interesting niche, because generally speaking they have to comply to regulations if you want to be able to wear them um, universally, either in the field or on parade. Now, that does more or less only restrict you to what the sword looks like when it's in this form. Okay, so in other words, the scabbard has to look basically regulation. So if you're in 1850, if you're in the rifles, then you're expected to wear a black leather scabbard with um, steel fittings. You couldn't wear a bright brass scabbard or an Indian scabbard with, you know, fancy decoration all over it. It just wouldn't be, you wouldn't be allowed to, okay? But if your scabbard looks basically right, then you're allowed to wear it. Additionally, if your hilt looks basically right, then you're allowed to wear it, you're allowed to use it. Now that within that, as you will see, there are, that leaves lots of leeway for changing other factors. For example, you could change the blade, and that was one of the most common uh, changes for British officers to change on their swords, was to have a, what looked like a regulation sword, but actually the blade was not uh, regulation, it was of a special type. I've got an example here for you guys to see relatively recent acquisition. I think I got it about a month ago. Um, and it is a, as you'll see, very similar to this regulation hilt. 
Okay, brass infantry officers, 1840, well actually the hilt is an 1821 pattern, um, but um, as seen on the 1845 pattern sword there. So regulation, completely normal infantry officers hilt, um, but the blade, as you can see, is a broadsword blade from, in this case, a Spanish Toledo made broadsword blade from a Bilbao hilted heavy cavalry sword um, and it's actually dated to uh, Carlos III, um, 17, I'll just show you on that side, there you go, 1785. So this is a pre-Napoleonic, this is an 18th century broadsword blade on a infantry officer's hilt. Um, now what's interesting is, so that's a great example of a non-regulation blade on a regulation hilt and that would be accepted and so long as it was worn in the correct type of scabbard that's now parade fine okay that's job done so that's acceptable this blade has actually been modified and it's been shortened now interestingly it's been shortened to 32 and a half inches which is the regulation length so they've actually taken a non-regulation blade which is uh, by this point uh, maybe nearly 100 years old, let's say 80 years old, uh, maybe a bit more than that, 80, 90 years old. Um, they're reusing an old blade because it's a good quality, nice blade, and they wanted a big broadsword blade instead of the typical sabre blade. And they've had it reshaped and shortened to be the regulation length. So that's a funny kind of paradox because in one sense they're using a non-regulation element, but then they're making it slightly more regulation by making sure it's the, the normal length of what an infantry officer is expected to use. But I should hasten to add, I have other examples which have normal types of blades, but are extra long, that are 34 and a half inches instead of 32 and a half inches. In fact, I have other examples which are really long. So they could vary the characteristics of the blade, either in size or design, okay? And finally, they could change elements of the hilt, uh, which didn't overall massively change the look of the hilt. So it would still remain basically regulation, uh, but you could make it better, materially better, better as a sword. One of those ways was the uh, patent tang or patent solid hilt, sometimes known, uh, which means that the tang is the same width as the grip. This of course makes the tang stronger and the hilt construction stronger. Another way is to, if you've got a brass guard by regulation, was instead to use steel, which would obviously be stronger and lighter. Um, so you could use a steel hilt but then have it gilded so it still looked like a regulation brass hilt. They went to great lengths to sort of meet the regulation but be outside the ordinary. There's even smaller adaptations to make them better like a brass guard, because obviously brass is softer than steel, less protective. Um, you sometimes see them with a steel bar uh, riveted on the inside of the knuckle bow to make it more resistant to cuts and being squashed. Uh, and various other options, and this is the, essentially the topic of the book that I'm theoretically going to release one day when I finally find time to finish the other two books that I'm already working on. So, there we go. I hope that somewhat answers the question. Important to remember that there's a big difference between privately purchased swords and issued swords, and generally it comes with whether you're an officer or a soldier. Uh, a ranker or a, a, an NCO. So they were, um, the, the men, the typical men were issued um, and the NCOs were issued their swords and basically had no control at all over what swords they used. Officers um, did have to approximately meet regulations but had leeway within that to change the exact details of the sword design so they could still roughly meet regulation um, and but they could still purchase a sword from whoever they liked the best manufacturer they could afford and change details of the design of the of the blade especially but also to some degree the hilt as well i hope that somewhat answers the question i know that i have addressed all of this in previous videos but there are always new people joining the channel so hopefully this is new info to some of you maybe i presented it in a different way and added a bit more info as well and certainly this is a new thing to see on the channel i don't think i've showed this in a in a previous video and it's a really nice example of how sometimes a blade a good blade was reused almost a hundred years later um, in this case um, and taken on campaign i would imagine it's certainly been well sh well sharpened this blade um, and it is a good nice broadsword blade um, from toledo right uh, thank you very much for watching and i'll see you guys for the next video cheers Thanks for watching, we've got extra videos on Patreon, please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers folks.